Okay, there we go. Hi, everyone, and warm welcome to today's webinar. My name is Cecilia. I work at the Division for Internationalization with International Student Recruitment, and I'm joined here today by Professor Valentin Troll, um, who is going to um, talk today about his research, about volcanoes, and about, um, yes, his work at Upsa University. Um, we will end today's webinar with a, a Q&A session. So if you have questions about the presentation or about the content of today's presentation, feel free to post in the Q&A box. Um, we won't be able to answer practical questions about the application, such as you know, supporting documents, scholarship application, et cetera. So if you have those kinds of questions, please send them to us via email instead, because today is all about uh, volcanoes and about Professor Troll. So with that being said, I will hand the floor over. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And it's a great pleasure being here today. And I see that uh, people from all over the world are joining. This is exciting. So thank you for joining in this morning. And uh, yes, I'll talk a little bit about my research. I'm a specialist when it, when, uh, when it comes to volcanoes, I, I work with volcanoes in all aspects, and uh, I'd like to share some views on that. Um, I also want to kind of stress that volcanoes are not just bad, so I will uh, share my screen now. And um, Cecilia, can you let me know whether the screen works? Yes, we can see your PowerPoint. Uh, Wonderful. Window. And this is now the full PowerPoint projection mode. So you can see my screen. And yeah, I'd like to stress today that uh, volcanoes have two faces. This is my important message. And I'll come back to this several times during my presentation. There is, of course, scary aspects, but there's a lot of beneficial aspects. And this is, of course, the case with many things. And uh, this is what I'd like to bring across today. So volcanoes as a source of hazards and as a source of resources. That's the things we hopefully gonna discuss today. So first of all, I'm gonna give some fundamental points about volcanology and volcanoes. Then uh, I will talk a little bit about myself and then uh, about my activities. And uh, then I'm gonna spend uh, some time on volcanoes as a resource because I think this is the underappreciated side. And then uh, I will also touch very briefly on volcanoes and culture towards the end of my presentation. So, well, I think we need to realize that magma is one of the most important probes into the Earth's interior. When we want to learn about the Earth's interior, we can only drill a few kilometers. Uh, the deepest drill hole is 12 kilometers, and uh, anything beyond that is very hard for us to actually get a hold of, to access. So what we uh, do is we look at magma as a probe, and uh, this tells us something about the source region of uh, the magma that's being brought up from volcanoes, but also about the rocks that have been passed by the magma during its journey to the surface. And uh, because magma, and once it's erupted, we call it lava, is uh, very diverse, you need a bit of knowledge, you need to understand the language of magma, and that's what petrologists do. Petrologist is the science of rocks. So my training is uh, in rocks and I read rocks, so to speak. So the, here's the kind of concept. If we have an eruption at the surface, we know it's connected to a much, much larger system at depth. And this is what we don't understand fully. And here we can make inferences from the rocks that have erupted about how volcanoes work inside, how the earth works inside. And uh, what I do to that, uh, to, to that effect is uh, use quite a wide variety of approaches and um, to assess the sources as well as all the processes magma experiences when it moves to the surface. This, of course, includes field work, but also experimental and numerical simulations of processes, but also petrological, geochemical, and isotope studies. Isotopes are um, elements that have different uh, atomic numbers, uh, have, uh, vari varieties, and here we can actually look at variations. This is a bit like rock DNA, if you will. And targets can range from hundreds of kilometer scale to individual volcanoes to very small kind of analysis of individual crystals. And this depends on the question we are asking and on the answers we are seeking. 
So I think I should stress that the volcanoes we see at the surface, they're only very small little cones compared to what we call the volcano magma system. There's a big connection to the Earth interior. And to understand the full volcano magma system, we must realize volcanoes are like the tip of the iceberg. There is a lot more. And we have to use a lot of different methodologies. And there's a lot of different aspects that come together to understand the system as a whole. So uh, people will look at the hazard at the surface and you can measure the chemistry of gases, for example. And that of course has influence on the atmosphere. There is uh, volatiles that are added from volcanoes. And then if we want to look deeper, we often use geophysics or we can assess the ores that form inside volcanoes. We can also look at how volcanoes interact with tectonic processes, with plate tectonics. We can uh, make experiments to understand these volcanoes. We can look at the minerals and crystals in there. We can determine the depth when, uh, at which they have grown. We can do geochemical studies. And uh, we can also look at processes in the deep mantle, what happens at depth. And these methods allow us to come up with a much, much more, more comprehensive picture. So what are we using all this for? Well, importantly, we need to assess hazards. And this is to avoid disasters. And uh, volcanoes, of course, can cause disasters. And this is a very important aspect. But volcanoes will also produce energy, geothermal energy, for example, and a lot of natural resources. And I'll talk more about this later. And of course, we also want to understand fundamental geological, volcanological, and geochemical phenomena that occur on our planet. So my mission is therefore to understand the dynamic interplay of magma generation, magma processes, the transport of magma and the eruptive behavior, and all the information we can glean from that for the processes that are relevant to society. What are the processes relevant to the society? Well, the hazards, the energy that we can potentially harvest from volcanoes and the resources. So here, a few words on hazards. So here is an image of uh, Vesuvius volcano in Italy, and uh, this sits right above Naples. And this is an old drawing. Naples is a lot bigger these days, and this is one of the problem zones in Europe where a lot of people live close to a very, very active volcano. And the last eruption of Vesuvius was 1944, and it erupted many, many times between um, the big devastating Pompeii eruption of 79 AD. And uh, here we really have to worry a little bit. So what can happen? Well, there can be big eruption columns and ash fall. And this is a big problem in many volcanic areas, but there's also more local hazards like lava flows and glowing avalanches, pyroclastic flows. There could be little domes of sticky lava. It's a bit like toothpaste coming out of a volcano, but once it cools down, they can break off and uh, cause landslides. So these are all uh, aspects that we need to consider when working with volcanoes, particularly in densely populated areas or in areas where infrastructure is very important. So this is the very direct effects and the immediate effects, but we also need to think about uh, long-term effects. And here is a few um, ideas what the volcanoes can do. Immediately hours and days uh, during and after an eruption, we have the pyroclastic eruption, we have the lava flows, the ash coming down, but ashfall can continue for days, potentially weeks after the eruption. And um, also the gases in the atmosphere can uh, cause some problems for uh, the global temperatures. And it's known that global temperatures can change by half a degree after a big eruption for several years. And um, therefore climate effects may be a problem. And if you also think of areas with thick ash fall, removing all the ash may take quite some time. So the cleanup is often a problem for, in some areas for actually months to years after the eruption. So, and uh, I said it before, volcanoes usually have a bad reputation. And this is because when you look in the news, you will usually see images like this. So this is Hawaii in the top left, uh, where lava flows are going over roads, for example, destroying infrastructure, or the images to the uh, right here and the bottom left, that's from Italy, from Etna. There we see lava flows intruding into the world of humans. 
And um, here the digger is trying to dig a ditch in order to divert the lava flow. But if the lava is big and uh, comes with enough uh, volume, there's usually very little humans can do. You cannot stop a lava flow of this dimension. And I've just seen it recently on La Palma. People were trying to save a church by digging a ditch, but uh, it was in vain. The church nevertheless fell two days later. And uh, we have no ways of stopping that. So what we need to think about is how to deal with that. So, and for that, we monitor active volcanoes. We have different methods of monitoring, and uh, this helps us to make predictions about when a volcano will erupt, how a volcano will erupt, and this will allow us to evacuate people, to protect the infrastructure, to build infrastructure that is resilient, to create communities that are resilient. So here we can measure geophysically, but also we can measure the rocks, and this is what happens at volcanoes. Increasingly, we use also remote sensing like uh, satellite-based uh, uh, radar interferometry, like the image on the bottom right. It measures whether the volcano is bulging up or whether it's calming down. And uh, if we have many of these measurements, we can usually work out if a volcano is in unrest or not. So if we have seismic activity increasing, if the volcano expands, if there's more gas coming, if the heat flow increases, then we can actually say, oh, this volcano is waking up. And by now, if a volcano is well monitored, we can actually be quite good in predicting when a volcano will erupt. So it's not about an hour, but we can say in a week or so, this volcano might be ready. And this gives you time to prepare, very important. So now a few words about myself. <clears throat> I, um, uh, I was born in Southern Germany and then I uh, started to do my university education there. After two years, I moved to Scotland to St. Andrews and I got my a bachelor degree there. And uh, then I moved back to Germany for my PhD at the GMR Research Center. And uh, then after that, I was working as a lecturer and then later as associate professor in Dublin at Trinity College. And then I did my habilitation or um, in Sweden, it's called the docent in uh, France. And uh, then in 2008, I was appointed as the chair of petrology here at Uppsala. And I have been here ever since. So, and um, the university kind of did some little report on me a few years ago, and they called me the volcano researcher who speaks with rocks. So indeed, I like to think this is what I do. I have a good sense for rocks, and uh, I worked with rocks ever since I my undergrad training. So rocks are complicated, and they need, they, they have a, they can be read if you understand their language. So I interact a lot with rocks and what we can learn from rocks and how we can use rocks. And this is my speciality. So this is areas I'm involved um, in certain projects, and uh, I've seen many parts of the world. Some parts I haven't uh, yet seen, but uh, I'm still keen to see the other parts that are open on this map. But I work, of course, in Scandinavia. I work in the North Atlantic, including Iceland. I work in Northern Canada. Uh, there's some old volcanoes there. I've worked in uh, um, Central America. I've worked in the Canary Islands and the Cape Verde Islands. I have some work in South Africa, but also uh, big projects in Indonesia. And uh, then I worked a little bit in New Zealand as well. So I will show you some examples of my work, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about myself, first of all. So geological work usually means it starts with field work. You have to go out, and this is the adventure part of it. So um, I had an um, intriguing interview the other day with um, a newspaper journalist about the La Palma eruption in the Canary Islands. And, Afterwards, after the interview, I saw he referred to me as the Indiana Jones of volcanology. I think all volcano researchers are a bit of Indiana Jones, but this is the adventure part. And it's, of course, very enjoyable if you like that kind of thing. So you go out, look at volcanoes, you take samples. Sometimes you have the opportunity to look at a volcano from above with a helicopter. But you also have to take your protective uh, uh, measurements very seriously you will have to work with gas masks and things like that. It's not always pleasant. So, but um, then you get the opportunity to look at active volcanoes. Etna has been erupting earlier this year. It's still erupting at the moment. And here is some images from February this year of Etna erupting. The eruption zone is not populated, so it's not dangerous for the population at this point, but it's spectacular to watch. 
And uh, I think one of the uh, biggest um, disasters that happened in Europe uh, volcanologically uh, this year was the La Palma eruption. And I've just come back from La Palma two days ago. And um, here the volcano started to erupt in the hills above some uh, settlements and the lava is actually flowing down into these villages. And this is a bit of a problem. And uh, here there's a lot of interest because a lot of people are affected. Almost 8,000 people are evacuated now. More than 2,000 houses are destroyed. More than 1,000 hectares of plantation land is affected. So this is quite serious. And what we do there is uh, we're looking at how the lavas progress. There's a map in the top left about how the lava field has developed over time. It starts off small and then it grows. And then this helps us to say something about where the lava might go next. There is also some aspects about growing of land, and this will, of course, um, influence the biosphere, the marine biosphere. And uh, of course, all of this will help us to say something about uh, which areas are at risk, and it allows us to warn people. And there is an image of evacuation, of ongoing evacuations. Whenever there is a village that might be affected by lava soon, we have to ring the alarm bell and get people out. So once we have uh, looked at uh, the field and we've taken rocks and we studied rocks in the field and mapped them, we have to bring samples back to the laboratory. And we work here in Uppsala, but also at our national geochemical facilities in Stockholm. And uh, the uh, top right image is the iron probe in Stockholm. And the top left, uh, the bottom left image is the electron microprobe here in Uppsala. And, uh, there we can look at rocks. The big rock up there is actually from the Iceland eruption that happened earlier this year. So uh, we can then look at the crystals inside and we can get information about how the volcano works in its belly inside. So, and uh, once we have uh, looked at rocks and once we've done the field work, a big important aspect uh, of academic work is we need to publish these results. And I find this personally very enjoyable. I enjoy writing. I enjoy expressing myself and my ideas via writing. So it's books and articles. And here's just some examples. And every now and then you have these really touching moments like this photo in the middle here. I've just been to the uh, um, uh, visitor center on Tenerife and they are selling my book. So I was really, really happy. So I was very pleased about that. So this is one of these moments where you think, wow, <laughs> So I wanted to share that with you. So um, then when it comes to teaching, uh, importantly, as an academic, you have three main tasks, and that is research, teaching, and outreach. So I'll talk a little bit about teaching. I teach uh, some large classes, but I often try to break them down into small groups. I think small group teaching is extremely important, interacting with individuals and working with individuals in respect to their individual learning styles. None of us is the same, we're all different, and therefore small group teaching allows you to work more closely with people. So plenty of practical exercises and small group teaching is my personal philosophy because we're all very diverse and um, I've been an international student coordinator at my previous job uh, at Trinity College in Dublin and I have teaching experience from different European but also non-European countries and I realized that uh, uh, we need to interact on a close uh, basis in order to really get the optimum learning experience for all the learners involved. So I uh, use this Chinese proverb a lot, uh, listen and forget, see and remember, but do and understand. So this is where my philosophy comes from. I try to be very hands-on, and this is, in my experience, very enjoyable for myself, but especially for the students. So this is where I come from when it comes to teaching. And that includes, of course, field teaching. So here's a few impressions. Uh, the top left image is uh, some rocks in Sweden. But then there's also other field trips. We do international field trips to warmer places um, than Sweden. But uh, Sweden is, of course, very fundamental because we have a lot of very good geology and a lot of deposits or deposits, for instance, that are economically very important. Many of them come from volcanoes. And uh, this is very good for educational purposes as well as for future job prospects. A lot of geologists that graduate here actually find jobs in the mining industry. And I should stress 
that uh, the Swedish mining industry has a huge demand that cannot be filled by uh, just graduates from Sweden. So uh, if you are interested in a job like that, that might be an avenue for you. So there is probably three to four times more people demanded by the active mining industry than we can produce. So, but uh, part of academic life is also examinations. And if examinations go well, there will be celebrations. So here's a few impressions. And sometimes you have to kind of go to an exam. It's often very formal exams are strict matters. And uh, then uh, you usually have a little party and there's an image of a little garden party after last year's, uh, no, two years ago, prior to Corona uh, with some of my master students and uh, then some images of exams I was involved in, like uh, in Iceland for PhDs or in Germany for PhDs with uh, students from all over the world. So, and um, I'm very proud of this. I work a lot with students and uh, for my PhD and my undergrad masters and bachelor students, um, we were rewarded a lot of prizes over the last 20 years and I'm listing them here. I'm not gonna go into details here, but uh, I like to think that interaction with students pays off if you work closely with them and they engage fully in this experience, then it usually produces very good results. And I'm very proud to have a long list of prizes that my students have received. So I said uh, my uh, third task uh, besides uh, research and teaching is outreach. So I'm pretty uh, active in outreach as well. And so I have been um, involved in um, advertisement campaigns that involves volcanoes. I have been uh, reporting for projects and um, for a larger national projects like the CNDS project here, but I've also been on television a few times like Daily Planet and things like that whenever there's something big happening, but also for Swedish television, of course. And um, just recently we were on La Palma, I mentioned it, and there was uh, two film crews with us, one from the BBC and one from National Geographic. And uh, so we are recording some of the work and making it accessible to a wider audience. And if you do things well, then every now and then uh, you get the honor of getting a little award if you do a good uh, project or if you uh, do some good teaching. So here's some um, uh, recognitions, some impressions of recognitions. And I'm showing them not so much about myself, I'm showing them to show you that working in academia can be very rewarding. So, uh, but um, here now, <clears throat> I'd like to go to the second part of my presentation. And this is the important message I wanna bring across to you. And that is volcanoes, as I said, often have a bad reputation, but I think we have to take a step back to be more reflective of this. Volcanoes and their underlying magmatic processes are the principal agents of redistribution of materials within our planet. They therefore are a key feature in understanding any localized concentrations of metals, of minerals, of fluids. And therefore they are crucial for humans and for our life on the surface of the planet. So this is what I'd like to stress for the next few minutes. When it comes to volcanoes, we uh, often forget that we are touching volcanic products every day of our lives. Metals and ores are dominantly volcanic in origin. Many gemstones are actually volcanic in origin. We still use a lot of sulfur um, that comes from volcanoes and there will be more sulfur from volcanoes because once we go off fossil fuels, uh, we will have a problem with sulfur because most of the sulfur we're currently using is a byproduct of fossil fuel refining. And uh, once we are off fossil fuels, we will have to produce sulfur again, and the best source is volcanoes. Building materials, volcanoes make wonderful building materials. They make good stones and rocks, and uh, we often use it in industrial applications like for abrasion and for geothermal power, of course. And actually, there's quite a lot of uh, food, drink, and cosmetics that connects to volcanoes, and I'm going to run you through some examples that I find rather enjoyable. So first of all, I mentioned before that uh, many of the metals that uh, we are needing for industry, also for green technology, they come from volcanoes. And here's a few of my students visiting a big mine here in Northern Sweden. And Sweden is the biggest producer of iron 
in the EU, and this will go on for many years. So there is a lot of job opportunities for well-educated geologists, and uh, they require an understanding of principal volcanology because the rocks here are old, but they formed in volcanic settings. So volcanoes have a practical use here in Sweden, despite the fact that there is no active volcanoes here. So, and um, when we think of iron, copper, lead, silver, and many of the rare earth elements, these kind of rare metals that are very critical for many industries these days, then uh, most of them come from volcanoes, particularly copper. The most copper at the moment comes from the Andes in South America, where we have these large copper deposits. But, um, that, well, and, and that's a volcanic region. Most silver comes from there as well. And um, many of the gold deposits can be uh, also volcanic, not exclusively, but many are. And iron, iron is <clears throat> the most important metal. If you think of building a bridge, you need a lot of iron and iron is for most parts volcanic in its fundamental origin. <clears throat> when it comes to critical metals uh, for green technologies, solar panels, wind turbines, but also for IT applications like uh, mobile phones and importantly for electrifying the traffic um, batteries, we need a lot of these rather rare metals that we only um, need to larger quantities over the last few decades. That's the rare earth elements, the lanthanides and actinides of the periodic table, but also cobalt, manganese, and lithium. These are battery metals, if you will, and uh, they come from volcanoes. The rock sample I'm showing here is actually a submarine rock. We got this from the Canary Islands. The lower part is a tuff, and the upper part is a manganese crust. This is material that comes from the volcanoes and settles out as fine dust and precipitates on the ocean floor. This material has a lot of manganese and a lot of cobalt. And this might be something we need to take into account in order to actually electrify the traffic because we have real shortages of these metals at the moment. So, and when we think of lithium, another important battery um, element, we have also too little of that right now. And here's an image from the Andes, from uh, the high Andes in Chile. Um, this was a trip in 2018. And there you see one of these salt lakes and the white is not actually snow. The white on the volcanoes is snow, but the white on the salt lake is actually salt. And that has a lot of lithium. And uh, this is what we might need to uh, quarry in order to provide our um, industries with enough lithium for electrifying the traffic. And uh, there is some work going on, of course, and uh, people are exploring this. So there is a lot of these salars being increasingly exploited. There's a lot of environmental issues there as well, because some of these processes reduce the groundwater, which is very bad for the local population. So there is uh, industrial as well as sustainable aspects that need to be worked on and considered. Big challenges for the future. But here's some impressions. It's um, uh, a growing industry, and uh, there is a lot of um, potential uh, labor possibilities for people in those areas. But as I said, there's also a lot of challenges and a lot of good work is required to balance these things against each other. So then I mentioned um, gemstones are often volcanic and uh, most big diamonds are volcanic and uh, they come from uh, kimberlites. It's a special rock type and um, they are very pronounced in South Africa, in Australia and places like that. The most big diamonds are actually volcanic in nature. So something I should not um, um, forget is that most old tools, humans first tools were often volcanic stone because obsidian or volcanic glass breaks very, very sharp. And uh, this has been used as uh, spear heads and arrow tips and things like that. And I should stress that um, obsidians are coming back into fashion as a cutting tool because uh, they are actually a lot sharper than steel blades. And a lot of surgeons these days increasingly prefer obsidian blades. And um, they make a cleaner cut and then your wound from your surgery heals better. So this is quite fascinating. I find that some of these ancient traits are coming back in fashion because they have some advantages. So this is actually something that volcanoes have given to us humans. We must, I believe, not forget about that. I mentioned sulfur before. 
Well, sulfur is traditionally used for two purposes, for disinfection and for um, making gunpowder. And uh, we need gunpowder in order to quarry, for example. Some people are using it for bad purposes, uh, but we need gunpowder for making a tunnel. We need dynamite. So, and um, this is very important. I mentioned earlier, sulfur will uh, have to come increasingly from volcanoes again. The image on the left is a sulfur quarry inside a volcanic crater in uh, Indonesia. And the image on the right is an abandoned sulfur quarry at 5,000 meters altitude in Chile, which I visited uh, three years ago. And uh, this will potentially be reopened. And uh, here I'm also showing some matches, some Swedish matches. Uh, they're called Vulcan matches. And uh, this is because originally the sulfur was from volcanoes, but disinfection is also very important. And many um, disinfection agents are like this particular um, soap from China, which is good if you have skin problems, they use sulfur for these kind of purposes. So I should also point out that white gold porcelain is actually largely volcanic in origin because the minerals, they come from granitic rocks. There's feldspar, quartz, and often uh, clay minerals, that is a decay product of granites. So um, porcelain has been a huge game changer for humans on this planet because we can actually wash the plates. We don't have to have a wooden plate that starts to get smelly after using it 10 times and things like that. So uh, for hygienic um, purposes, porcelain has been tremendously important. So this is volcanic in origin in its essence. Now, having mentioned this, uh, abrasion and pumice rock, uh, pumice stone is often used for this. Stonewashed jeans came up when I was a, a teenager and uh, I always wondered what this meant, but actually I worked it out, it's pumice stone that uh, causes the kind of uh, stonewashed jeans effect and this is what it's done. It's tumbled in a big um, tumbler with stones and then it gives you this worn out effect. But this abrasion uh, uh, aspect is not just applied to jeans, it's actually uh, applied to um, foot scrubs and uh, um, all sorts of beauty products that um, peel your skin. And here's a few examples there. So if you use any of those, you are actually touching um, pumice stone, like here, for example, you see the pumice stone in there or pumice foot scrub, um, et cetera, then uh, you're actually touching volcano. And uh, not just um, for your feet, actually, if you use this whitening toothpaste, there's often very finely uh, ground up a pumice stone in the toothpaste. It abrades the kind of, you know, um, things on the teeth you don't want. And uh, so you actually might be putting volcanic rock into your mouth in very small quantities if you use this type of toothpaste. But uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about energy now. This is a big geothermal energy plant in Indonesia, and this is um, in um, in Sum uh, sorry in Java, uh, close to Sumatra. This is in West Java, and um, here we uh, see that there's a big elaborate piping system that channels volcanic steam into um, uh, an industrial application that allows you to generate energy. And this is relatively clean energy because the volcanic steam would be produced anyway. So whether we are having it poof into the air or whether we're actually using it makes little difference to nature, but a huge difference to us humans. So how does this work? Well, we have a heat source at the, the bottom somewhere, a volcanic heat source. And uh, if we have water coming close to it, it will heat up. You can either pump the water there yourself or you take water that's coming anyway. And once this is hot, it can drive turbines and you can make electric power. The top right image is a, a power plant in New Zealand, in Wairaki. And uh, one problem we have with these systems is that the pipes, they get, uh, they get clocked very quickly. And I'm showing an image in the bottom right of a clocked pipe. But um, you have to replace the pipes quite frequently, kind of once a year. But the material inside these pipes is actually very useful because first it contains a lot of silver and people are taking it out to take the silver out. And if you mix it like they do it in Iceland, it's actually good for cosmetics because it's good for your skin. So uh, here the Blue Lagoon in Iceland is a geothermal um, pond that comes from the leftover waters of a power plant. 
It's a big tourist attraction and they're selling these skincare products and they're very popular. And um, this is some impressions from Iceland. Uh, this is the Blue Lagoon in the bottom right. And as I said, it's actually a byproduct from geothermal power production on the Reykjans Peninsula where the recent eruption happened. And this is the main power source for Reykjavik. And uh, here's just uh, a little bit of uh, a feel for you. 40% of the geothermal power in Iceland is used for electricity, then 43% for space heating, and then they can heat swimming pools, they can uh, have fish farming, then they can heat greenhouses as well. And in fact, uh, um, surprisingly, Iceland produces a lot of bananas, believe it or not, because of the greenhouses. So this is what cheap energy does in Northern Europe, for example. So a few more words about volcanic rock as a building stone. It's a very fine building stone. Basalt is very solid and tuff is a good insulator. So depending on the different types of volcanic stone, uh, you can use them. And I'm showing here um, the cathedral in Clermont in France. And uh, this is entirely built of volcanic rock. So volcanic rock has been used for many, many generations. And uh, this is a little church in uh, Tenerife on the Canary Islands, which are volcanic in origin. And you see the, the brownish rock, and I'm also in the quarry here in the top, in the bottom left. And uh, in fact, this rock is very porous and it's uh, light, but very sturdy. And the, most of the big cathedral in Central and South America actually built of this rock. And in the Canary Islands, the um, uh, Spanish empire was trying a lot of things, including the building of colonial churches. And here's one of the earliest ones at a village called Arico. So, but uh, volcanic rock is of course used all over the world. So the biggest um, uh, Buddhist temple in the world is in central Java, it's Borobudur, and uh, that's built entirely of volcanic rock. And very close to it is a gigantic Hindu temple. They're all about a about thousand years old or a little older. And that's Prambanan. And here's some images of the a Buddhist as well as the Hindu temple. And they're all built of the volcanic rocks coming from this volcano here in the bottom uh, right. And that's Merapi volcano, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It's 3000 meters tall, and it has inspired not just the industry in the area, but also the culture quite dramatically. Now, coming back to Europe for a second, um, in Italy, where we have a lot of volcanoes, the use of volcanic stone is going back to the Roman Empire, where people have developed the first cement, actually, the Pozzolana cement. It then got forgotten in the Middle Ages, and now we're rediscovering it. So this is also a volcanic phenomenon that has been exploited. And volcanic rock can be very sturdy. It's great for millstones. Most really good millstones are made of volcanic rock. And uh, it's a fantastic cement supplement. Volcanic rock is often ground up and added to cement. And here I'm gonna show you some images. This is uh, volcanic tuff deposits in Indonesia. And uh, this is at Merapi volcano. And it looks a bit uh, random the other way this is quarried, but not just are they extracting the material for cement, they are also creating a sediment trap. If there's a new eruption, actually it will be slowed down because of this random kind of ripple effect in the ground. So here we have uh, good things for humans, but we also kind of minimize the effect of the next eruption. So a few words about um, um, uh, agriculture. Here we see that uh, volcanoes can actually produce a lot of fertile soil. And this is an example from Indonesia again. So here, tropical spices grow very well on volcanic soil. Coffee is also very important. Most of the coffee is actually grown on volcanic soil. And uh, the biggest coffee consumers in the world is actually Scandinavia. And uh, so we in Scandinavia drink a lot of coffee because it's so dark here. And uh, this comes usually from volcanic regions. If you go to these areas, you can here see some of these uh, um, um, coffee plantations um, that are built inside volcanic craters like here in East Java. And uh, you can actually do some studies on coffee and how the volcanic soil affects the coffee. So here's the uh, development of coffee beans from this uh, volcanic crater up to the final product. Tea is also often grown on volcanoes. So I don't wanna go into much detail. 
So is chocolate, by the way. Here's some chocolate beans from Indonesia. So if you like chocolate, then uh, you probably have touched volcano. And uh, some brands are capitalizing on that. The most famous uh, brand in Iceland is actually called Lava. So um, chocolate is often linked to volcanoes as well. So is wine. Here's some wine from central France grown on volcanic soil from the Canaries, but also from Etna, for example. And um, this is very good for the wine. There's a lot of minerals in volcanic soil. And uh, here's some impressions from Lanzarote in the Canary Islands, where they grow wine in very complicated, very dry conditions. But the volcanic soil is good because it stores a lot of water, allowing you to grow the wine even in very difficult conditions. Now, I'm closing here the last two, three slides. This is volcanoes and culture. And uh, this is a very important study that, uh, or aspect of study. And that is wherever there's volcanoes, there's also cultural influences. This is the Meru volcano on the left. I visited it a few years ago. It's the one that just caused the big eruption in uh, East Java, killing some people, unfortunately, and uh, causing a lot of devastation. But here on the right, we see what's called a fire dance. This is Javanese people trying to persuade the volcano to calm down. It's uh, an interesting phenomenon. I think it helps people to cope with the situation a lot better, but I'm not sure it does actually change the volcanic eruptions very much, but it helps the society. So, and uh, volcanoes in Japan have been inspiring art ever since uh, uh, we can remember. And in fact, uh, if you think of mangas, Japanese drawings and cartoons, they started with these, with these volcano drawings. And here you have actually one of the first manga is one of the first comic strips where you actually have riding bubbles and a volcanic event coming together. And uh, here's some more elaborate ones from uh, Hokusai. They are several hundred years old, but these are effectively uh, images that come with a little bit of text. And of course, it goes further in Europe. We have um, writers like Jules Verne who um, have uh, the idea of traveling into volcanoes and seeing the center of the earth. And it continues today. Hollywood is still exploiting volcanoes and uh, there are several movies that do that. And uh, just for my daughters at home, they like um, um, Disney movies with, uh, for example, uh, volcano ghosts and spirits being involved. So I just want to kind of highlight that uh, volcanoes are very important from a geoscience aspect for a sustainable future. And here I'm showing this um, diagram by the Geological Society of London. And I'm in red encircling the area where volcano research comes in. It's about hazard mitigation. It's about uh, technology and mining and minerals. And it's also, of course, about science outreach. So I'd like to thank you. And uh, maybe I've been a few minutes too long, but uh, excuse my excitement for that. So I uh, say thank you for your interest. And if you have any questions, I will do my very best to answer as many of them as I can. Thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. We have quite a few questions, actually. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, um, let's see here. Also a lot of general praise about a very good presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, let's start out with one from, oh, I can't see the full name here. Um, so regarding the eruption in Indonesia on Mount Semeru, yeah. uh, what are your views regarding the eruption and how did heavy rains facilitate it? There is a problem, uh, we see this a lot, that um, water and magma, they're not good uh, friends. What happens is if magma and water get in contact, um, the water often evaporates and it is converted to steam. The volume increase from water to steam is factor 1000. So suddenly the water increases in volume by factor 1000. And if this happens in a confined space, it causes a big explosion. We call this phreato magmatism or hydrovolcanism. And uh, this is often very explosive and very dangerous. And if you have active volcanoes and you add a lot of rain, for example, or uh, melt ice caps on volcanoes, um, snowy tips of volcanoes, this is a very unfortunate consequence. And this can happen in these parts of the world. 
Um, a question from Alexander uh, says, as a geologist, you probably have been traveling a lot for your research, which we also saw in the presentation. Were students also able to accompany you on such research travels? Absolutely. Um, like, for example, uh, we offer stipends here. Um, students can apply for stipends, quite considerable stipends, uh, up to on the order of a thousand or two thousand uh, dollars US equivalent. And that allows them to fund their master research, for example. And I had master students in Indonesia, in the Canary Islands, and of course, also PhD students, of course. But uh, this is very much the case. And I had students in Iceland and of course also in various Swedish places like in Arctic Sweden. And uh, so yes is the answer, they can. You have to apply for a stipend in order to cover the costs, but this is very possible here. Thank you. Um, speaking of PhD, we have a general question. The student doesn't mention the program, but uh, in general, from your experience, uh, do you have a lot of history of uh, uh, master's students um, accelerating to becoming PhD students at your department? Absolutely. Uh, I had several master's students that uh, then became PhD students. In Sweden, all positions for PhD have to be advertised and people will apply. And if it happens that uh, you are the best qualified person for the PhD position, because you might just have the right training, then you have a good chance. About a third of my master's students, uh, uh, sorry, about a third of my PhD students have been former master's students, but the majority is externally recruited. It's the best candidate that matters, but it's possible to become a PhD student also when you had a master degree from Uppsala University. Yes, and uh, that's also important to note that the recruiting process for PhD in Sweden can be quite different from any other countries. So, as you mentioned, you apply for a position in, in open competition, essentially, and the best candidate is selected. Um, so, um, correct. That's yeah. very much. And I, I think it's a very good system because it allows people to excel. Once you put the effort in and put the work in and you're very good, then you have a chance of getting a good position. I like that kind of system. Um, a question about sulfur. Can you yeah. elaborate more on it being a disinfectant? Absolutely. Um, I grew up in an area where they make wine. And I remember as a small boy, once a year, we had to kind of disinfect the barrels. And uh, I hated that job because it was particularly smelly and it's, um, it stings in your nose and in your breathing apparatus. And um, um, yeah, it kills a lot of germs. And um, this um, is what we have used in various industries. And um, this is of course what sulfur is uh, doing. It's a very chemically aggress aggressive uh, uh, element and therefore it actually wears down a lot of uh, bacteria, a lot of organic materials. And if you inhale too much of it, you will actually get damage in your lungs because you are also organic. So sulfur will attack you as well. This is why when you work there, you have to work, uh, wear a gas mask, for example, because the soft tissue in your lungs is particularly vulnerable. Thank you very much. So we have a question about um, water. You mentioned um, in the salt uh, desert that it can cause problems with the water reserve. But here we have a question about in development, in developing countries, there is mineral contamination of groundwater, which is used for domestic hands affecting the quality of water as well as health. Are there new technologies that are being employed to reduce this mineral content in this domestic water? Well, I uh, like to uh, I like to kind of uh, uh, be a little nuanced about that. There is developments, and there is a lot of good technologies that are being developed right now. The problem is they're not always implemented because they're sometimes expensive to implement. In Sweden, we have this big mine in Kiruna in northern Sweden. And it's governmentally owned, and they are trying to pioneer these environmental aspects. And they are filtering the water. There are special filter systems based on other minerals, zeolites, zeolite crystals. They have little tunnels, for example. You can filter water through that, and uh, it catches a lot of the bigger elements and compounds that are in the water. You also use that, for example, if you uh, try to uh, filter water for hardness. 
if you have this little hardness filter, this is based on zeolites very frequently. This can be used industrially and it's a mineral catching process, but uh, it's not um, using any nasty chemicals at all, but you have to implement it. You have to pay the price. And unfortunately, um, this is one of the downsides. Uh, not all companies, not all industries, not all countries are prepared to invest that. And I'm not blaming anyone here. I know that some countries have bigger issues than water problems. If you are fighting uh, inflation, if you're fighting uh, poverty, if you're fighting a rebellion, then uh, the mineral water might not be your biggest concern. Some countries have huge issues with HIV, et cetera. So, but in principle, it can be done. And hopefully in the future, we will lift um, the prosperity all over the globe and then this would be increasingly implemented even in areas where it's not yet done so at the present day so this would be my long-term hope and my goal and i hope that my work can contribute a little towards that um we have a question about whether there have been any volcanic eruptions in sweden there has been volcanic eruptions in sweden but luckily a long time ago there is a lot of old, uh, very old volcanoes, 1.9 giga years old, and they gave rise to many of the ore deposits. But there is a younger volcanic system in southern Sweden, and uh, this erupted in the Jurassic era. So this is when the dinosaurs were still roaming around. But there's, this is the youngest volcanic rocks that we have in Sweden in the Jurassic era, and they are in Skåne, the southern province of Sweden. Um, a question about Indonesia again. Um, what happened in the case of the recent eruption there? Was it that the early warning system didn't work or did, didn't they have one? They have actually surprisingly good uh, early warning systems, but uh, there is this increasing phenomenon that uh, we are learning. Uh, it started uh, to dawn on us with Merapi volcano in the early years of uh, this century. Then we had the 2014 eruption at Kelut uh, in East Java and then Sumeru. And we actually saw this also on the La Palma situation in the Canary Islands. Usually volcanoes give warning weeks before they erupt, but every now and then volcanoes can erupt with very little warning. And this is an interesting phenomenon that needs further work. And this is actually something I'm quite fascinated by. Some of these volcanoes give warning only of two, three days. And by the time the authorities and the monitoring personnel realize something is not quite right, it can be too late. So if you have weeks, it's easier to plan and uh, evacuate people in time and bring everybody into safe ground. Like, um, several of the big eruptions like um, the Merapi 2010 eruption, it was signaled weeks before and the amount of people who were actually affected by the eruption um, as fatalities or casualties was surprisingly low. But when the volcano just does this in two days, you have very little time. You don't even fully understand what's going on before the eruption happens. And this can be a real problem. And this requires a lot more work from our side. Uh, a follow-up question to that. Are there means of harnessing the volcanic activity before they become devastating, like exposure to water for rapid cooling or steam generation? Yes, this is an interesting kind of aspect. And we're very, very, our efforts are very rudimentary here, but the, the idea is wonderful. Um, NASA has released um, uh, some uh, what they called crazy ideas uh, a few years ago. Uh, they put their smartest minds onto finding crazy solutions to things. And they said that, would it be possible to drill into volcanoes and let the pressure out in a regulated way before they actually erupt? They got a lot of criticism for some of these ideas, but there's of course some fundamental truth in there. So there is, again, a lot more work needed. Imagine you have an air balloon that's blown up to, to bursting or close to bursting, and you drill into that. Uh, it might just blow in your face. That's the one side. But if you manage to capture it with a lot of flexibility and you're allowing it to vent in a regulated way, there may be some volcanoes where you can do that. Not all, I fear but it's some. So in principle, the idea has been discussed by NASA scientists and it's out there now. And 
There is applications for a big project in Iceland now to drill into Krafla volcano. And there is also the Krafla geothermal system. So there they hope to use this energy in the volcano less dangerous and harvesting the geothermal energy for electricity. So you're absolutely right with that. Um, I think we will have to do a, a final question for today um, because we are running out it's of time. It's my fault. I was talking a little too long. So. <laughs> no, that, that's okay. Um, so the final question, again, regarding Sweden, from the different technologies installed to detect signs of possible volcanic eruption, has there been any signal of a possible eruption in Sweden? I hope not. Sweden is actually surprisingly stable and uh, Sweden is rising because of the isostatic uplift after the glaciers were removed. So um, we have surprisingly few earthquakes and um, um, uh, coastal erosion is not a, a huge problem because of this rising phenomenon. Uh, the uh, mantle underneath Sweden seems also very stable. There is no strange broken off lower crustal parts. So to my mind, there is very limited chances for a volcanic eruption in the near future in Sweden. So we are pretty stable here. And we're also pretty stable in the sense of coastal erosion, rising sea levels. And uh, also the air is very good here because we are high up in, um, uh, on the globe. So environmentally, I think Sweden is doing rather well. And the risk of big earthquakes and volcanic eruptions is comparatively small. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so am I, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And um, thank you so much for a very interesting pr uh, presentation um, and for answering questions. Um, and I would also like to say thank you to all our prospective students participating today. Thank you for answering or for asking good questions. And uh, this webinar was recorded, so we will send you a recording either today or uh, tomorrow. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions about your applications, feel free to send them to us via email and we'll do our very best to help you. Um, I hope that you all have a nice weekend and thank you again for joining. Bye bye. Thank you, Cecilia, for thank organizing you. this. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye, everybody.